Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, how pleased we are to have been involved in this project. Uh, I think it's been, you may can correct, correct me, Tom, but it may have been the first time we've really come together to work seriously on combining our science and your science. And um, it is, I think, the first step along a new road, actually, which I think uh, the previous speakers have articulated so well, that we cannot see these two things, the, um, the climate disruption, weather disasters, natural hazards, uh, side of the story separate from the side of the story that's about saving lives and livelihoods and taking people out of pov poverty. And um, those who've known my past will know that I've always had a, my personal research expertise is in, in tropical climate and, and weather with a great interest in India and China and, and so forth. Um, and Africa, so this is very. This project's been very close personally to my heart of what I want to see going forward. So what I wanted to do, and I've lost some. Oh, you can see the slides. Was just to really sort of look forward a little bit because I think it is fair to say that the climate community is only just getting to the stage where we can move from saying uh, climate change is happening and it's due to us and it will have profound implications globally to really say much more about what it means at the local and regional level. So in a sense, I think we're at the cusp of a whole new way of working just because the climate science has matured to the level at which we can talk about, in fact, climate services. So anybody that's heard me speak about climate services will know what I mean. And I think for the Met Office, We've been looking um, increasingly in our weather forecasting services, whether it's for the UK or the wider international community, beyond just giving a weather forecast to say, well, what does it mean? And I think we do need to, I've put up a slide I often show that I call the circle of securities. We do need to look at this in a holistic way. None of it can be looked at independently. You can't look at food security without looking at water security without thinking about uh, the health of the population that are exposed to food security, whether they're malnourished or not, and so on and so forth. Um, and we have to look at that not just in the context of pressures from the natural environment, but changes in our exposure and vulnerability, and those come through urbanization, population growth. We have to look at this thing in a much more holistic way. Now, that's very challenging. And there are uncertainties in every step of the road. But unless we do, I don't think we'll be making the right assessments. I would like to, I mean, India is very interesting. And I've spent a lot of time working on Indian problems and working with Indian scientists. And we've talked a little bit today about the rise of the middle class, which is really quite remarkable in India. I think one of the things that we need to factor in is that there <coughs> are limited natural resources here. So even though we talk about the rise of the middle class and those that remain in the poverty gap, that rise of the middle class puts enormous pressures on water and energy. And water is a precious resource in India. So again, this is a, a, another dimension that we need to factor in when we thi think 10, 20, 30 years down the line that India uh, farmers are already borrowing water, ancient water, and finding that it's disappearing, and that is they're losing their livelihoods. So this is more than just, you know, does the monsoon arrive or does it not? We need to look at this in a holistic way. So I think this is the moment to start this. Um, and it's not for th 2030, it's the here and now. Um, and we've talked about uh, Typhoon Felin this morning at length. And it is a remarkable story that so much was done, uh, lives saved, maybe not livelihoods, I suspect, of those that really matter, the fishermen on the coast and so forth, um, uh, because of early warning. It's also true, and I'll come back to this later, that failing was not as devastating as the previous one because its track was slightly different. 
and it didn't hit at the very lowest lying areas of uh, Orissa. So, you know, there's there are, are there are things here we have to factor in and not try and too much oversimplify the story, look at all the facets. The reason I'll show this slide is that one of the things that was published recently was a very nice paper um, by UK and US scientists looking at how much of recent extremes could we attribute to climate change. And I think this is again a very important part of the whole business. Not all the extremes we see are exacerbated or will be exacerbated by climate change. We need to be clear about that. And some of these here, yes you can, uh, particularly drought and heat waves, there is a very clear attribution to climate change. And the US drought, US heat waves were certainly, um, you can even quantify the contribution uh, from, from anthropogenic climate change to the recent heat wave in the US. The reason I put Hurricane Sandy up there is that there's another bit of the story here, which is about uh, climate change. It's not just the change in the weather, and Hurricane Sandy may have been an unusual storm, but doesn't appear to have had a climate change influence. But the impact of Hurricane Sandy was affected by climate change due to sea level rise. And they were able to show in this report that, that was published recently that the rise in sea level since 1950 doubled the chance of a major inundation from Hurricane Sandy. So whilst we are focusing here more on weather and climate extremes, we also have to think of how the impact of these events changes because of the background level that's changing because of global warming. And I think sea level rise is something that's not in the report, but probably is the next iteration we should consider. Um, I just wanted to say clustering and a little bit about clustering and concurrency of hazards, because again, this is something that with the limited time we had, we really couldn't do anything about. But this is actually the satellite picture from 10th of October. And you can see the three things that are gathering out there in the over the Bay of Bengal and the West Pacific, uh, failing just spinning up there in the Bay of Bengal, the typhoon that went into Vietnam, and the further blob that's headed up north to Japan. And these sorts of things we understand meteorologically why you get these clusters of events. And these are things that, with the more sophisticated climate models that we're now beginning to run, um, these are the post fifth assessment report models, really, um, we can start actually talking about clustering and concurrency of hazards. So not just here flooding, but storm surge, wind, and so forth, the various damages that can go along. And likewise with drought, we haven't really talked in the report about wildfire, which I think is a pretty serious hazard, actually, mm -hmm. which in a sense is a, um, an expression of the drought. So we need to do much more, I think, on this, the whole clustering and concurrency of hazards and what that means for livelihoods and resilience. I just thought I'd show you one report from the fifth assessment report. Um, and, it, and, you know, the quote, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, is a very profound statement of what we think will happen to rainfall. Um, and these, this, this shows the wet regions in the tropics, 30 south to 30 north, and most of the vulnerability we're talking about is in that tropical belt when we think about the countries that you've identified and the dry regions in those. And what you can see and what we've already detected um, is, is a shift to the wet regions becoming wetter and the dry regions becoming drier. And so this is a trend that we are pretty sure about and we need to think about what its implications are. You'll also see there are two scenarios on there. The one that we focused on in this report is the green lines, the RCP 4.5. I have to say it probably doesn't matter which one you look at at 2030 because there's a commitment here from what we've already emitted into the atmosphere, so I think it doesn't really matter. Um, chances are we're actually following RCP 8.5 in terms of what the emissions are doing. So I don't think, you know, that's why I think the, the, the focus on the next two or three decades is a good one 
from the climate point of view and for other reasons, and, and, and I'm sure for the socioeconomics. Um, you'll also see that there's enormous amount of volatility around those, those lines. These are just annual averages. And I think one of the things that when we think about climate change, we've got to move away from talking about mean changes over a, a decade or 30 years to talking about the volatility of the climate. Because in a sense, that's what people feel. And it's what we should focus on. And, um, and in that respect, um, Enzo, El Nino, remains, of course, one of the big, the dominant vari variations in climate. There was an interesting paper in Nature this week suggesting that El Nino variations may get more extreme under climate change. I don't know how robust that is, but it's a nice contribution to the literature on this, and we should take it seriously. The fact of the matter is we're actually quite good at forecasting El Nino a few months ahead. We're quite good statistically and um, in saying what scenarios are likely to be for different um, phases of El Nino and this is from our season latest seasonal forecast model of the rainfall differences in this case in December, January, February they're equally good if you look at June, July, August. There is now remarkable skill in the global teleconnections for rainfall around the tropical belt and we need to find ways of exploiting that and I think it we have to deal with this myth that climate models can't do these things. They jolly well can, and they can do them incredibly well. And we need to find a way of using that information. Um, likewise, um, we've made some fantastic progress recently in the major drive to much higher resolution climate models. So this is the this is the the the, the new the new generation of work that we can do because we have models here this is a, an example of uh, Atlantic hurricanes for a, an extended period for 15 not quite 15 years 14 years from observations and from one realization with our se latest seasonal forecast model we actually make uh, in a se in a forecast 40 realizations so you have an event set that allows you to really talk about probabilities of land falling hurricanes or cyclones, typhoons. And therefore you can talk about the risk, the probability of changes in where uh, these storms will make landfall going forward. When we have a model that that's, is that good at seasonal forecast timescales, we can start using it to look at future scenarios. And that's the next stage in this work is to produce scenarios out to 2030, 2040 with this model. So a very exciting era for us, I think, of, of being able to talk about this. I should say, f um, I've nearly finished, um, that the other thing about all of this is that we should never look at these capabilities uh, uh, in isolation. So what we can do to talk about decadal and longer timescale projections is also part of a whole seamless part of science where we can also talk about doing things today to make uh, uh, communities more resilient, better prepared. And I think there is, this is the intersection that I think we're still striving for in the report, that actually if we can understand how to get people, stop them falling into the poverty gap, f stop them losing their livelihoods today through better um, actions, being more resilient, being more prepared through the use of better predictions, uh, I think we can make big differences in the trajectory that we look at for the next 20 years. And this is just an example in the Philippines. This is Typhoon Bofa. Um, and just so happened that we had staff out there and we were able to do activate a very high resolution weather forecasting system for them, um, which gave them much earlier warning of the track and intensity of this typhoon several days ahead and it allowed uh, hundreds of lives to be saved and the result of that is that we're now working with the Philippine Met Agency mm. to help them develop their forecasting capabilities and I think this is actually part of the key of the story really that if we can help these in country for them to be to have better 
predictions, weather forecasts, climate predictions, to be able to make their own plans. So build the capability in country. This has to be part of the story. Um, finally, I think that whilst we think about this report is predominantly looking 20 years ahead, and there are massive uncertainties, I think as much in the poverty models as in the climate models. In fact, in some ways, I, as a <laughs> climate modeler, I look at it and think, mm, I'm glad I've got the, the fundamental <laughs> equations of physics here to deal with. Um, and we do look at, need to look at it in a probabilistic framework and look at the whole way in which the uncertainties in both bits components play together. It isn't a linear system, it's highly nonlinear. But I do think that building resilience today helps us plan for tomorrow. And I think that has to be one of the key messages that we need to get. And then as we look, repeat this exercise and expand this exercise, because I think there's masses more we could do here, um, we can see how things we can do today can really change the trajectory of poverty alleviation in the future. So thank you very much for your time and for listening. <laughs>